this is just chapter one. So if I don't finish, then there's a part two. Alright, chapter one. The flowering of human consciousness. Evocation. Earth. 114 million years ago. One morning, just after sunrise. The first flower to ever appear on the planet open up, opens up to receive the rays of the sun. Prior to this momentous event, the heralds, the heralds, an evolutionary transformation in the life of plants. The planet had already been covered in vegetarian, but vegetation for millions of years. The first flower probably did not survive for long, and flowers must have been remained rare and isolated phenomenon. Since conditions were most likely yet favorable for widespread flowering to occur one day however a critical threshold was reached and suddenly the weapon an explosion of color and scent all over the planet if a perceiving consciousness had been there to witness it much later those delicate and fragrant beings we call flowers will an essential part in the evolution of consciousness of another species. Humans will increasingly be drawn to and fascinated by them. As the consciousness of human beings developed, flowers were most likely the first thing they came to value that had no utilitarian purpose for them. That is to say, was not linked to survival. They provided inspiration to countless artists, poets, and mystics. Jesus tells us to come, contemplate the flowers, and learn from them how to live. The Buddha is said to have given a silent ceremony once, which he held up a flower and gazed at it. After a while, one of those presents, a monk called a Mahajayapa, the sermon. According to legend, that smile, that is to say realization, was handed down by 28 successive masters and much later became the origin of Zen. Seeing beauty in a flower could awaken humans, however briefly, to the beauty that is a central part of their most innermost being, their true nature. The first recognition of beauty was one of the most significant events in the evolution of the human consciousness. The feeling of joy and love are intrinsically connected to that recognition. Without our fully realizing it, flowers would become for us an expression and form of which is the most high and most sacred and ultimately formless within ourselves. Flowers are fleeting more and more delicate than the plants out of which they emerge would become like the messengers from another realm like a bridge between the world of physical forms and the formless now, they not only had a scent that was delicate and pleasing to humans but also bought a fragrance, a fragrance from the realm of spirit using the word enlightenment in a wider sense than most conventionally flowers as an enlightenment of plants and any life form in any realm mineral vegetable human or animal can be said to undergo enlightenment it is however an extremely rare occurrence in this since it is more than an evolutionary progression it also implies a discontinuity it is development Sankarpins under inconceivable heat and pressure.
pressure turned into diamonds and some heavy materials into other precious stones. Many crawling um, reptilians, rep, reptilians. Uh, the most earthbound of all creatures have remained unchanged for millions of years. Some, however, grew feathers and wings and turned into birds, thus defying the force of gravity that held them for so long. They didn't become better at walking or crawling, but transcended crawling and walking entirely. Sometime in immemorial, flowers, crystals, precious stones, and birds have a special significance for the human spirit. They are, of course, temporary manifestations of the underlying one life, one consciousness. Their special significance and the reason why humans feel such a fascination for an affinity for them can be attributed to their adrenal quality. Once there is a certain degree of presence of still and alert attention in human beings' perceptions, they can sense the divine life essence and one indwelling consciousness or spirit in every creature, every life form, recognize it as one of their own essence and so love it as themselves. Until this happens, however, most humans see only the outer forms, unaware of the inner existence, just as they are unaware of their own essence and identify only with their physical and psychological form. In the case of the flower, the crystal, the precious stone, or the bird. However, even someone with little or no presence can occasionally sense that there is more there than the mere physical existence of that form, without knowing that this is the reason why he or she is drawn toward it, feel an affinity for it, affinity with it, because of its eternal nature. Its form obscures the indwelling spirit to a lesser degree than in the case of other life forms. The exceptions to this case are all new life forms, babies, puffy puppies, kittens, lambs, and so on. They are fra fragile, delicate, and not yet firmly established in the materiality, an innocence, a sweetness, and a beauty that are out of or not of this world still shine through them. They, they delight even relatively insensitive humans. So when you uh, when you are alert and uh, contemplate a flower, a crystal, or bird without naming it mentally, it becomes a window for you into the formless. There is an inner opening, however, sight is light into the realm of spirit. This is why the, these three enlightened life forms have played such an important part of the evolutionary evolution of human consciousness since ancient times. Why? For example, the jewel and the lotus, fl lotus flower is a central symbol of Buddhism and the white word, the dove, signifies the Holy Spirit in Christianity. They have been preparing for the grounds of more profound shift in planetary consciousness that is destined to take place in the human species. This is the spiritual awakening that we are beginning to witness now. The purpose of this book. It's only a pale reflection. Can human beings lose the dense, dense 
misunderstood and often greatly distorted. It certainly did not transform human behavior except in a small minority of people. Is humanity more ready now than at the, mo at the time of most early teachers? Why should this be so? What can you do, if anything, to bring about or accelerate this inner shift? What is it that characterizes the old, girl, egoic state of consciousness? And by what signs is the new emerging consciousness recognized? These and other essential questions will be addressed in this book. More importantly, this book itself is a transformational device that has come out of the arising new consciousness. The ideas and concepts presented here may be important, but they are secondary. There is no more than signboards pointing you toward awakening as you read a shift take pla pla takes place in you. The book's main purpose is not to add new information or beliefs to your mind or try to convince you of anything, but to re bring around about a shift of consciousness that is to say is to awaken. In that sense, this book is not interesting. Interesting means that you keep your distance and play around with ideas and concepts in your head and your mind. Agree or disagree, this book is about you. It will change your state of consciousness or not, or, or it will be meaningless. It can only awaken those who are ready. Not everyone is ready, but many are. And with each person who awakens, the momentum in the collective consciousness grows, and it becomes easier for others. If you don't know what awakening means, read on. Only by awakening can you know the true meaning of that word. A glimpse is enough to initiate the awakening process, which is irreversible. For some, that glimpse will come while reading this book. For many, for many others who have not even have realized it, the process has already begun. This book will help them recognize it. For some, it may have begun through loss or suffering. For others, through coming in contact with a spiritual teacher or teaching, through reading the power of now or some other spiritual uh, spiritually alive and therefore transformational book or any combination of the above. If the awakening process has become an, begun in you, the reading of this book will accelerate and intensify it. An essential part of the awakening is the recognition of the unawakened you, the ego as it thinks, speaks, and acts, as well as the recognition of the collectively conditioned mental processes that accelerate the unawakened state. That is why this book shows the main aspects of the ego and how they operate in the individual as well as the collective. This is important for two related reasons. The first is that unless you know how the basic mechanics behind the working of the ego, you won't recognize it and it will trick you into identifying it, identifying with it again and again. This means it takes you over an imposter pretending to be you. The second reason is that the act of recognition itself is one of the ways in which awakening happens. When you recognize the unconsciousness in you, that which makes the recognition possible is the arising consciousness is awakening. You cannot fight against your ego and when, just as you cannot fight against darkness, the light of consciousness is all that is necessary. You are the light. If we look more deeply into humanities and ancient religions and spiritual traditions, we will find that underneath the many surface differences there are two core insights that most of them agree on. The words they use to describe those insights differ, yet they all point to a twofold fundamental truth. The first part of this truth is the realization that the normal state of human mind of most human beings contains a strong element of what we must call dysfunction or even madness. Certain teachings at the heart of Indo Hinduism become come close to seeing this dysfunction as a form of collective mental illness. They call it Maya, the veil of delusion, Rama, Ramana, Marsh, Mar, 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 Marishi. One of the greatest Indian sages bluntly states the mind is Maya. Buddhism used different terms according to Buddhism, according to the Buddhist.
of state of the human law of humanity is one of the original sin. Sin is a word that has been greatly misunderstood and misinterpreted, literally translated from the ancient Greek in which the New Testament was written. To sin means to miss the mark, as an acre who misses the target, so to sin means to miss the point of human existence. It means to live unskillfully, blindly, and thus to suffer and cause suffering. Again, the term is, is stripped of, a, of its cultural baggage and misinterpretation, points to the dis dysfunction inherent in the human condition. The genius of humanity are impressive and understood. I don't want to 